Hello and welcome back to Into the 99. Today we're going back into some lore. I have John and Evan with me and before we even get into it, John and Evan, how are you guys doing this week? Oh, I'm doing great. I've just been putting up a bunch of hay, living my best life. Working away? Oh yeah, never stops. I've been okay. I can't complain too much. It's been busy at work, but you know, three minute pillows helps. There you go. I've been pretty good as well. Today we're going to get into some other characters we talked a little bit about in Modern Horizons 2, and I said that I was going to talk about these characters because they're really cool. So we're going to get into the Great Mending and kind of what was going on in and around that area, and then talk about some legendary creatures that have just a ton of backstory. So we might not get through all of it one in one shot. We might have to do a two-part, but let's get right into it, and why don't you guys take it away with the Great Mending? Of course. So the Great Mending, also known as just the Mending, was a process that healed Dominaria from the damage that was caused by the Time Rifts through the sacrifice of multiple Planeswalkers. It all began when Jessica sealed the last major rift on Otaria in 4500 AR. It all caused the remaining fractures to heal, first in Dominaria, but then spreading throughout the multiverse in a chain reaction. The Mending allowed mana to flow freely throughout Dominaria once more, returning life and hope to a dying world. All creatures had appeared from the past uh, during the Time Spiral Crisis had returned to their original time, and with the last Time Rift closed, Dominaria's mana had flowed back into the land instantaneously, and the world healed and rejuvenated quickly with that infusion of power. After the Mending, the multiverse found a new balance with a Planeswalker spark, with uh, far-reaching consequences. Planeswalkers lost their immortality and godlike powers, good, and uh, much of their additional magic power. For example, they stopped being able to transport other people during a planeswalk. At the same time, all existing planner travel tech also stopped working, so just kind of universally, just kind of just everyone stopped going going about for a little bit. Yeah, Dark only age. planeswalkers could go. By themselves. Yeah, by themselves, not with anything else. Yeah. Uh, new tech was possible, but so far the only example seen has been the planer bridge created by Rashmi on Kaladesh, which was recent too, so this is... Uh, Still trying to work on ways to get back uh, back over. Which, I mean, Kaya can also kind of get yeah. around that, I guess. There, there's Real. a few ways, like uh, the Tybalt Realm Sword kind of thing. Vorinclex traveled a little bit. There's a little bit of ways around it, but in general, no. In general, you are stuck where you are unless you have the spark or are yep. dead and coated in the liquid metal stuff that Nicobolus has. Lazotep. Lazotep, that's the one. Lazotep plating. Well, as a tap plate, um, the mending occurred about 60 years before the present. So again, it occurred 4,500 AR. So we are currently in 4,560 AR. Remarkably, this is around the same time that the uh, great Aether boom of Kaladesh occurred. Okay. Kind of cool. Kaladesh is a really interesting plane in general. I, I, I really want to talk about Kaladesh at some point because it was really overlooked story-wise, but it was probably one of the last like great books with what was going on with Jace Frasca all of the, everything over there. because our Kaladesh. Or no, yeah, sorry, yeah, Jace Vraska were Ixalan, but Kaladesh is the Chandra story. Yep, because that was Chandra's uh, home plane, I believe. Yeah. And um, I, don't like it. I think we're going to go back because there was some glassing. Oh, oh, wait, no, was that Ixalan? That was Ixalan. That was Ixalan, oh. No, no, the, the, the glistening oil I thought was on Kaladesh, isn't it? Because it's the metal no. world. Or no, it no, would be overrun it if it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is a valid point there. Listen, no, we are more experts. There's an M21 card that has like a glistening oil fountain Not on the it. Decor. Yeah. yeah. So it's an okay card, with, yeah. with the Great Mending overall, that kind of healed. Uh, I, I believe what happened with the shards was that was from Urza's big blast sealing everything off, causing the Ice Age, correct? Yes. Yes. Then there was all the time spiral crisis, all that stuff. They they had to really fix his problem. Urza was not a good guy in the story. The uh, the the anti hero of sorts. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but one John's of the Marshall, one of the main planeswalkers characters and someone who was in Commander Legends that we do want to start talking about is Jessica. Who is Jessica? What is Jessica? We talked a little bit about Karn making. Uh, mirrored and essentially for a training ground for Jessica on uh, when we did the new Phyrexia. But, yes. but who is this Jessica woman? Um, well, Jessica was an Otarian barbarian from Dominaria who then became a planeswalker. She's um, she's the sister of Kamal and she has had many lives, 
Uh, this has le led her to be called the Thrice Touched by Infinity, as well as the Thrice Reborn. She now, has... if you remember, Kamal was Chainer's best friend. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So they were, they were both good fighters. Yeah, we talked about Kamal a little bit last time. Uh, Kamal, spoiler, is going to be part of this episode if we actually get to it, but there's a lot mm -hmm. in these, so we're, we're going to talk Jessica first, the sister of Kamal. Yeah, yeah, so John, do you want to take away the uh, what, what exactly Jessica is and who she is? For sure. So Jessica, Jessica grew up in Balthor Rockfist tribe, spending much of her time learning from the dwarves rather than the other humans that made up her tribe. For this, she was slightly shunned for her dwarven-born opinions, and she lived peacefully until Kamal left to seek his fortunes in the gladiatorial pits of Cabal City. Later, concerned with Kamal's well-being, Jessica and Balthor followed Kamal's footsteps. When Kamal returned to the village, he was deeply enthralled by the influence of the Marari. And during an assault, on, an assault, Kamal lost control and went berserk, slaying most of his kin and striking a horrific blow against Jessica. This shattered the Marari spell, and in deep grief, Kamal sought out somebody who could save the dying Jessica. He brought her into the care of Centaur Seton, and she ultimately was captured by Braids and brought to the Kamal Patriarch. Yeah, so Kamal, Kamal's got a real sad story. But when she was injured, the reason they took her is because they knew she was so powerful. The Patriarch's attempt to destroy Jessica instead gave birth to Phage the Untouchable. Through the unique combination of Jessica's Planeswalker Spark, the Patriarch's Killing Touch, and the intervention of Numena Kubar, Jessica was cursed so that anything she touched would rot, and because of this, the only fabric she could wear was silk, and she could only touch inorganic, inorganic items like stone and steel. Phage fought loyally for the Patriarch, and due to the unique nature of the relationship, bore him a child. This child turned out to be the reincarnation of Kuber. And who is this Numena Kuber? Was one of the Numena and was worshipped as a god by the Cabal as an embodiment of avarice and profit. He was reborn as the child of Phage and the first, who grew one day for every death made by a Kamal member, reaching puberty within days. He had power over gold, able to swim through a vault of coins. He's Scrooge McDuck. He's oh my god! Able to swim through Scrooge McDuck is the god of the Cabal. Interesting. Uh, able to swim through a vault of coins as easily as water. He united with the other Numa to destroy Corona, but was killed when she tried to kill him, all by encasing them in a block of solid stone. In ancient time, he slew the black primeval Croesus the Perjurer and received his powers. Oh, Croesus. Man, the Elder I've Dragons are cool. That's... Yeah. Yeah. That's that's pretty metal, yeah. I yeah. can't wait till we get to a weekend, weekend uh, bad guy. Yeah, so... Each person that Phage killed formed the seed of a death worm inside her, and when touched by Exeter's dream magic, those death worms were sent out into the world, leaving her once again Jessica. In order to save the land from being completely destroyed by the death worms, she pulled them back into herself, damning herself to a life as Phage. One worm survived, the one that contained the essence of Nivea, Phage's first kill, and that worm consumed Exeter so he could rest with his love forever. Phage left the Cabal and jo ah, joined Zagorka, that's a weird name, in Sanctum, where she was tracked down by a chroma for killing Nivea. Phage's existence ended when Kamal intervened in the battle, and we'll go from there after. So what, we'll, we'll talk about what happened with Phage a little later on. But you guys can, yeah. uh, uh, let, let's jump back over to, we'll, we'll talk a little bit of Corona and who Corona was now. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, Corona does have a lot. So, um, Corona here was a manifestation of all Dominarian mana bought, brought into being by the aggregation of Akroma, Phage, and Zagorka being slain by Kamal's Soul Reaper. Um, during her, uh, her brief existence, she further devastated the already war-torn Otaria and disrupted the very fabric of magic on Dominaria. Her abilities stemmed from that of faith that anything uh, a being could believe of her, she could accomplish. Yeah, Corona's Pretty really cool. Pretty cool power. Yeah, if you, if you believe in Corona, Corona can do it. I believe Corona can give me a million dollars. <laughs> I believe oh, corona, corona will make is... everyone like and share this episode. <laughs> I think Corona would do very pair very well with the Orcs of 40K. Yeah. That would be... So it says, it would be over. Corona existed once long and long ago before the time of the Thran when the new mana rose to power. The three wizard kings spread out from Ataria, conquering all lands they touched until there was no ground they did not claim. Such things are not meant to last, though, and the three tyrants turned upon each other. In this conflict, they gave, being, they gave birth to a being they called Mother, the living incarnation of magic itself. Dunumena knew that she was a threat of the greatest measure and focused on destroying her before she ever learned of her full abilities. 
It costs the Numenor their powers and more their very lives. Dang. Dang. Sometimes you gotta you gotta give it all to deal with the omnipotent God that can do anything you believe in. Was it worth it? You decide. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So they believed that she could destroy them, and that's why they needed to stop her. That's true. It's not wrong. Stop believing. Yeah, exactly. Should just believe that she can't. <laughs> You're too weak to kill me. Right. That's that's the thousand IQ play there. Yes, but Corona came back, and what happened there? Yes, oh. Corona's very existence tormented her. She was plagued by the question of her life meaning. The chaos Corona caused stemmed from that uh, need to discover her place on the greater scheme of all things. She was really just trying to find her place in the world. Uh, Corona became misguided in her role as magic incarnate, reflecting basic human emotions such as fear, greed, and aspiration. Corona discovered that nearly every creature, human or beast, praised her completely and without hesitation. Corona soon assumed that due to her phenomenal powers and the praise she received, she must be a goddess. A misconception propagated by all those who bent their knee to her. The confused Corona attempted to seek out one who would equal her both in status and powers from uh, someone whom she could learn. Corona summoned five portals to search for her equal, each representing a color of magic. Through these portals came those who could not equal Corona. Teferi for white, Lo- Loalin for blue, good old Yog Dog for black, Tears for red, and Multani for green. That is quite the quite the pickings. Yeah, Teferi, Lawalin, Yogmoth, Fears, and Multani. I don't know if Fears or Lawalin, but I sure know the other ones. Lawalin was one of the three Numena of Dominaria. Uh, okay. The others were Kuber, the god of the Cabal, and Averu. Uh, Lawalin is the lord of the hidden waters, and he slew primeval uh, Dromar the Banisher Ooh. and received Dromar's powers. Okay, okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, her meeting with Yog Moth scared Corona. She was told that the only god to exist on Dominaria was Gaia, who was hurt by Corona's presence. Corona began to liken herself to Yog Moth and decided that if the gods would not accept her, then she would destroy them and assume power. That's not good? No. With a newfound sense of identity, Corona sought to follow Ixidor, the mortal avatar of Lowellin. Kamal had enlisted Ixidor's help in convincing the reborn Numena to defeat Corona, and they began their conquest at the uh, Grand Coliseum. Here, Kuber built his new fortunes, and faced with Corona's imminent arrival, the uh, three fled to Averu, assuring Kuber's assistance in once again defeating Corona. Uh, she did arrive too late to stop the trio, but her very presence led to the destruction of the Grand Coliseum as her worshippers tore the foundation apart in their need to reach the Shining Goddess. That is some praise. That is, yeah. That's pretty hardcore devotion. Thousands Literally, died as the stones fell upon them, and once again, Corona fled the scene. Literally tearing the house down. Yeah, bring the Hours walls later, down. <laughs> Hours later, Corona arrived above Averu, and there in the skies of the city, it was a dream given flesh, a being that was her equal. The being, which called itself Arian, called for her to come near, and new emotions welled within the goddess. Attracted to Arian like a moth to a flame, Corona tried approaching the strange being, but suddenly found herself under attack from the three Numena. Unable to escape, Corona endured endless barrages of magical attacks, losing much of her power in the process. Only Kamal's intervention stopped the Numena's assault. Arian had been a trap concocted by the Numena to bind her to their will, and Kamal chose to see her banished from the world instead. Corona and the multiverse. I did not know about this. Corona arrived at the Blind Eternities which held the pathways of numerous beings throughout history. Desperate to escape this strange place, Corona followed a random path to another plane. Instantly, yellow skies stretched above her. Baffled at her location, Corona decided to ask help from the locals, and she repeated uh, Gerard Capuchin, a name that she had followed to reach this place. The locals' reaction were far from welcome as they decried her as being associated with the Cho Armin rebels and the heretic. Terrified, Corona fled by moving to another plane. The next plane was a place filled with floating meadows, the very air brought refreshment to the weary limbs of her two disciples, Sash and Waistcoat. A being calling herself Sarah came to them, telling the trio that they could not stay here. After explaining their plight, the angelic figure only mused on the fact that Corona reminded her of another ancient being, Urza, who had intentionally caused great damage to the multiverse in his uh, efforts to protect Dominaria against the Phyrexians. Sarah's only advice was to remind Corona that she was Dominaria's magic and Dominaria was her true home. Huh. This is neat. I like this a lot. Yeah. Corona's awesome. 
little traveling through uh, Magic's history here. Um, rejected from two planes, Corona planes walks to the remnants of Phyrexia, which had been decimated by the Nine Titans. Looking at the blasted landscape made Corona think of Yogmoth and of how she related herself to him by claiming that they had both caused great devastation and been rejected by Gaia. Gaia? Gaia? Gaia. I never, Gaia, thank you. I can never say that properly. However, the haunting voice of Yogmoth once again broke her thoughts, and he urged her to stay on his plane. Having been warned by Sash and Waistcoat that those words were identical to the ones Arian had used to lure her into the trap, Corona simply dipped. Got I, on out I would there. simply not do that. Yeah. That's, uh, can't, can't lead a mouse to cheese twice. I mean, you kind of can, because it's a mouse, but that was, that was a bad analogy. Once again, she picked another path towards another plane. Here, a plane of bright metal met her. On this plane, she was welcomed by a man. Corona approached the man, and he humbly confessed to being the lowly servant of Lord Mocked, the creator of the plane. However, as he was the only person in sight, Corona easily saw through the man's ruse, and she embraced him, knowing him to be Lord Mocked himself. He told her of his involvement with the Mirari and the tragedy it had caused, and which he felt responsible for. Corona insisted it was not his fault anymore, and that it, uh, it was her fault for being what she was. Having then uh, been freed from his conscience, the grateful Lord Mock transported Corona back to Dominaria. Lord Mock was nice. Karn. Yes. Interesting. The Lord of Machines. That's probably why the Phyrexians worship him that way. Corona hugged Karn. Canonically. Yeah, true. Um, it, it did say as well, by the way, I believe it was the design team that said that Corona's summoning of Yogmoth was actually just in her brain. I think that's what we found out when we were doing yeah. the Yogmoth. It was like part of her psyche. Yeah, it wasn't yep. the real Yogmoth, so he is dead. Yes. Wink, yes. wink. <laughs> Plot armor. Um, you guys, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go for it, John. So, oh wow, this is a twist. So, driven mad by her own power, or perhaps her contact with Yogmoth. Okay, so maybe Yogmoth isn't dead. Um, Krona attempted to take over all of Otaria by gathering those who praised her as an army. She racked the continent with war, destroying entire cities in, a sing in singular fell swoops, and the number who opposed her dwindled. Finally, the only oppos opposition to her rule was the city of Sanctum. Kamal, who had been instructed to stop Corona by the mysterious Lord Mocked, stood against Corona with the Numer Numena and the Mirari sword in hand. Their stand was to be in vain, though, as Corona came into her power. She killed all three Numena with one mighty spell, and Kamal unwillingly bowed to Corona. Disarmed and unwilling to fight for the for his part in the opposition, Corona decreed his death. Ironically, it was, was the two friends Corona had it, truly trusted which betrayed her, Sash and Waistcoat. The two unmen pierced Corona's belly with the Marari sword as she sought to strike down Kamal. Both unmen were the advice from Lord Mocked, who then arrived and revealed his true form. He took Corona away from the place from that place of madness and death to his artificial plane. The Marari sword was removed, and Corona regressed to the three women whose deaths created her, finally settling into Jessica with the manifestation of her planeswalker spark. Okay. So who is wow. the Sash well, and Waste Coast? Two, uh, so Sash and Waste Coast were th two of the three unmen created by Ixidor and Atari on Don area. They were known as troublemakers. Unmen are basically living portals that let the dementia caster teleport in case of an emergency. They seal themselves and basically die when someone passes through them. Sash and Waste Coast did not want to die for Exodor, so they left. For a while, they gained bodies of cockroaches, a gift from the ca uh, Cabal Patriarch. Then they eventually got new human bodies, but sustained wounds by walking naked across the blistering sands of the desert. They were found and healed by Corona, who ended up befriending them because they were not affected by her aura and didn't worship her. After some time, Corona decided that they could help her discover her true identity, so she took them as disciples. When Sash came to the conclusion that Corona was a magic manifest, she instantly took on the idea and started to test her newfound powers. Through much trial and error, they discovered that her powers were based on faith. After Corona's power began to rise out of control, she attacked the Numena and killed many people. In the end, Kamal came to bring an end to Corona's reign, but he almost lost the fight. Acting under advice from Lord Macht, Sash and Waste Coast then betrayed Corona and pierced her belly with a Murari sword. Very cool. Hmm. Oh. There's apparently some controversy. Within the storyline fans, there are many questions regarding the exact nature of her experiences with Tefari, Sarah, and Yogmoth. In Tefari's case, in the Time Spiral no uh, novel, he told Freilis he had never met Corona, and when doing so, she saw him as a god of white mana, and that isn't Tefari's main domain. In Yogmoth's case, in the Planar Chaos novel, Lord Wingrace told Karn that he made sure that Yogmoth was truly dead after the Phyrexian invasion, therefore couldn't have met Corona. 
And in the Homeland comic, Sarah wasted away, having chosen death over life after her beloved pharaohs died. Hmm. Hmm. Some controversy. Yeah, most well, fans. Wasn't she, wasn't she walking through time during the, at this point? I don't know. She was in the Blind Eternities, but yeah, if the Blind Eternities can travel through time, that spells real big trouble because there is still an Eldrazi Titan out there. <laughs> Uh, most of fans agree that these contradictions are either explained by her precarious state of mind that she actually created these hallucinations or that Car- uh, Corona met with alternate yeah. reality versions of these characters. Makes yeah, sense. so I think the Blind Eternities are just kind of like pathways pathways through space-time, essentially, that like yeah. link to the beings that hold sort of like, you know, tethers through it. Yeah, yeah. so Corona was made up of Phage, Zagorka, and yes. uh, Acroma, correct? Acroma. Yes. Yep. Let's talk a little bit about Akroma because she's pretty cool. And there's not too much on Zagorka. Um, Akroma was a sentient illusion created by Ixidor on Dominaria in the image of his lost wife, Nevia, who was killed by Phage in her premier pit fight. Kind of a cool way to lose your wife, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I mean, there's um, worse ways, yeah. There are, like, that's, I would be proud saying my wife died in a pit fight. Um, after Ixidor had been dumped into the desert because of his extreme gambling debts to the Cabal, he wallowed in grief over his lost love. So strong was his heartache that when his shaping abilities manifested, they took the form of a chroma at the, to- at the cost of Ixidor's right arm. She was crafted in his dream and made of his flesh. Ixidor gave her but one objective, to avenge Nevia no matter the cost. She flew forth from Locus seeking phage. Almost immediately, a chroma made her way into a fedo, where ce- uh, celebrations were taking face taking place, my apologies, for the recent completion of the Grand Colosseum. In the arena itself, the pit fights were taking place in a spectacular match between Phage and her brother, Kamal. As the fight raged on, Akroma knew that her hopes of Phage dying in combat were coming to an end. Apparently, Kamal would neither hurt nor kill his fallen sister in the hopes that she would see the error of her ways and return to her old self. That's a good brother. Uh, Chroma was left with no choice but to kill Phage with her own hands. The bright cheers of the crowds fell silent as Akroma alighted the sands of the arena, and Phage at once received a taste of her own medicine, as Akroma's touch acted as a the- anathema to her. Unfortunately, Kamal interfered, and Akroma had to flee, grievously wounded and maimed as her legs fell victim to Phage's touch. Okay. Uh, Akroma um, returned to Ixidor, weeping in immense pain. Ixidor forgave her for what she saw as her failure and decided not only to heal her, but to enhance her. However... First, they would need to serve. Uh, he'd need a new being to serve as new legs. Ixor found the perfect answer and used his powers to dream a jaguar into existence, which he killed immediately. Ixor imagined Akroma full and healthy, and as he opened his eyes, Akroma's legs were replaced by those of a jaguar. She became, in effect, a centaur angel and was filled with new strength as well as certain other feline tendencies. As she became, <laughs> I did not know that she had jaguar legs. As she became accustomed to her new form, Exeter told her that the war would be inevitable, and true to his prediction, a dual force of the Cabal and the Crosen Forest was marching upon Exeter's lands. Exeter began to create as many beings as possible, and Akroma led them into battle against the combined forces. The battle ripped the lands apart, but Akroma's forces appeared to be winning. That is, at least until they encountered Phage. All at once, the tides of battle turned, as every being that Phage had ever killed was reincarnated as death worms, which burst forth from Phage's body. When every worm had left, she became Jessica once again. The last death worm, the soul of Nivea, sought out Ixidor, swallowed him, and escaped as Akroma watched helplessly. To prevent the worms from destroying the very fabric of the world, Jessica absorbed the darkness back into her, all but the one that had taken Ixidor. So Akroma is canonically a cat girl. Yeah. <laughs> cat girl confirmed. I'm done with it. There's a lot I'm learning this episode. Yeah. This might check um, some boxes for people. <laughs> uh, cat bird girl she has uh she has bird wings oh my griffin yep Ooh. there it is left without a leader Akroma na- assumed the responsibilities of spreading Ixidor's message effectively founding a religion around him using her angelic and heavenly appearance she turned the natives of the, of the surrounding plains to her cause thousands joined her side through the promises of hope and honor Though she was pleased with the developments in Locus, Akroma still bore her rage against Cabal and Phage. I like the little rhyme there, Rage and Phage. Weeks later, she received a very interesting message. Apparently, some of the survivors of the Nighttime War had found a city in central Lotaria. They'd begun to inhabit it, naming it Sanctum. Led by good old Zagorka, the Sanctum had been receiving numerous citizens over the past months. 
Real quickly though, just because Zagorka is coming up again, Zagorka was just a normal, normal lady living in Otaria who came into conflict with Ixidor and Kamal. Zagorka had sought employment in Cabal City with her mule Chester. This led her to the war against the wizard Ixidor, where she and other refugees found an asylum in uh, in an abandoned city that they called Sanctum. She quickly became their leader, and as the city grew, its mystery started to unveil. City, ah, uh, city was in fact Numena Avaru, who considered Zagorka as his mother. In the final battle between Akroma and Phage, Kamal killed them both, and accidentally Zagorka as well, which, as we know, led to the creation of Corona. But going back to Akroma here, one of these refugees was her hated nemesis Phage, who, to all appearances, had denounced the Cabal. However, Akroma was not fooled by her ruse, as she had learned from Braids earlier the Patriarch had intended, intended to use Phage as a vessel to receive his god Kuber in human form. Armed with the knowledge, she flew to the Sanctum in order to confront Phage. Upon her arrival, things were not as she expected. As her rival came into the battlements, Akroma was somewhat amazed that Phage claimed that this would not be a war of swords, but a war of words. In some confusion, she returned to Locus, only to discover an assassination attempt by Stonebrow, one of Kamal's former generals. However, before he could strike to uh, before he could strike on Akroma, one of Ixidor's creatures converted him to her cause. That's some quick word smithery there. Under Stonebrow's guidance, she invited a host of distant nobles to dine with her in hopes of winning them to her side in the holy war against Phage. Stonebrow was made a humble servant for the occasion, and all seemed to be going pretty good, despite Akroma's awkwardness. Uh, just as everything seemed to be going uh, well, her chief advisor told her that the guest's shoes had disappeared. What? What kind of fetish stuff are we reading? This is insane. The shy, cat girl, the shy cat girl foot fetish. So Akroma went to investigate. She saw a portal where the shoes had been. So the, the chief advisor just said, hey, the shoes are gone, but didn't, didn't mention the portal that was where the shoes were that he had to look at to notice the shoes were gone. That's good. That's real good. Uh, the portal led to the deathworm who had escaped, and without a second thought, she jumped into the portal to confront her master. She raged against the worm, demanding it to release her creator, but the worm was simply too large and her attacks too weak. In one mighty gulp, the worm... Vord Akroma. The angel <laughs> the angel found this suited her for the moment and began to search the worm's vast digestive tract. Pretty big worm here. The acid ate away at her flesh, destroying her feet and wings, but still she preserved onward because she had four feet. After a long and tiresome search, Akroma finally found the crouched form of Ixidor in the glimmering form of a woman whose resemblance she bore. She tried to converse with Ixidor, but it was no use. He was wallowed in grief and wished to remain in the spirit of his dear Nevia. Okroma obliged his wishes and she departed, all acided and mangled up. The um, months soon passed and Okroma's spies had reported that uh, strange events were happening in the Sanctum. With her healing process complete and she now has four feet, no, I'm sorry, four blades replacing her feet because she's oh, awesome. Dang. Ah, old knife feet. <laughs> Good old four knife feet. Wasn't that, a, uh, wasn't that a character in uh, Kingsman? True. The, I, the, I haven't seen the king lady with knife. So good. I know. Akroma began the move into Sanctum with her army, which consisted of the Southern Order and various other nations that joined her cause. If attacked, the Sanctum was not going to last a week. Within days, she arrived and was surprised that their glyphs and statues she had seen before had become sentient and welcomed her arrival. Upon closer inspection, the glyphs directed her to a dome in the middle of the city. Eventually, she made it on top of the dome, and there, her rival Phage confronted her. The two enemies spent little time conversing, and before long, a fight broke out, with the two women trading blows with one another. As the fight intensified, Akroma saw the hulking form of Kamal wielding the Soul Reaper. Just as Kamal swung his axe at them, Akroma noticed the form of Zagorka jumping from one of the surrounding towers into the dome. The Soul Reaper sliced through all three women, killing them almost instantaneously. As the explosion that was triggered by the impact engulfed her body in a blinding light, Akroma Akroma finally died in peace, knowing that Ixidor had been avenged at last. As she died, a new goddess, Corona, had been born. Yeah. And Dang. then also there's an alternate reality version. If one of you guys wants to take that one. No, she uh, she was composed of red magic as opposed to the white magic that she was created by from Ixidor. And, rather, and black was blue in this reality as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, but anyway, she was made without Exodor's sacrifice of his arm and bears an alternate title matching her personality, a chroma angel of fury. Yeah, she's represented in a lot of cards and quoted in a lot as well. Oh, yeah. 
She's in Angel of Fury, Angel of Wrath, which, by the way, beautiful new artwork on both of them. I really, really like the redone artwork. Oh, they're awesome. Oh, yeah, the trees. Yeah. Uh, then Acroma Visions of Ixdor, also a great card. And then she's that in Acroma's Angel Blessing. Avatar. Acroma's Devoted, Acroma's Memorial, Acroma's Vengeance, Acroma's Will, and also Sword of Vengeance. I did not know that that was her sword, but that makes sense. She's in an un, she's in an unset as well. Depicted in Unhinged. Yep. Ladies' night. I am just noting, I don't see any pictures of her with the cat legs. Only seeing knife legs or normal legs. So we have yet to see Jaguar Acroma. Jagchroma? Jagchroma. Rocket-powered turbo slug? What? That was one of the unset cards she was featured on in oh, the art. Oh. <laughs> I was just confused as to what super haste was. Yeah, that's Kamal and Akroma. That's super cool. haste? This that's... may attack the turn before you play it? Hmm. That's that is cool. phenomenal. Ladies Night? Future Sight? You lose the game at the end of your next turn unless you play this card's mana card. Oh, that's... I love unsets. Unsets are pretty silly. Um, we we have a little bit of time left. Let's let's go into Kamal and see who he is now. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Okay. Uh, where is there? We are. So uh, Kamal was a powerful human barbarian from the Paritic Mountains of Otaria on Dominaria. Otaria on Dominaria. A lot of rhyme in here. I love it. I absolutely love it. He was the brother of Jessica and the pupil of good old Balthor. He left his mountain home to go to Cabal City in order to earn himself wealth and fame through beating people up for sport. His uh, pit fight, his pit fighting technique was a mixture of barbarian close combat skills and Brazilian jiu-jitsu alongside a splash of red magic, <laughs> which he combined using his prized possession, an enormous two-handed sword rumored to have been crafted from the staff of Urza. That's pretty cool. Okay. We all know that all those creations are good. This. Right? What's up with the barbarians having all this cool stuff? Eh, they get it by killing people. It's kind of what barbarians do. Fair not enough. a uh, not a great deal is known about Kamal's childhood, save that his grandfather was the legendary lava mancer Matt Hawk, and he once kept a pet fire beast. The creature burned off his hair, which never grew back. That, that's why he's a little bald boy. Upon arriving in uh, the Cabal City, Kamal was initially sneered at by the wealthy locals because of his shabby appearance and barbarian origins. But through an impressive demonstration of his magical skills and just beating people up, he was able to gain sponsorship and enter the pits. He first saw the Mirari when he was shown the fighter's prizes and became obsessed with obtaining it. His talent soon became clear as he won a number of matches, where he also befriended two other fighters, the Centaur Druid Seton and the Cabal Dementia Master Trainer. We, uh, we remember Trainer. Yep. And uh, if I recall, Seton was the one that healed uh, Jessica or tried to yes. heal Jessica, and then he, like, fell into into the hands there. Anyway, Kamal quickly became a crowd favorite and earned himself a small fortune through the wagers. However, following an attack on Cabal City by a Krosen dragon, Kamal's life took a dramatic turn. He aided in the city's defense, killing the enormous lizard. However, his victory was bittersweet as he first found himself buried beneath the creature's carcass, Smelly, and then upon freeing himself, he found that his kill and the rewards for it had been accredited to the ar arrogant Avon warrior Lieutenant Kurtar. As a final insult, Kurtar's choice for his prize was the Mirari, whose powerful magic called to the Barbarian and amplified his already intense resentment and jealousy. Kamal thus began his journey to claim the artifact for himself. That's pretty mean of oh, Kurtar. What a dick. Right? Yeah. Kurtar returned to the Order's Citadel while using the Mirari's power to take control of it, struggling with the Order's ideal of destroying dangerous magical devices. Kamal hotly pursued him and infiltrated the fortress, but was unable to steal the Mirari before Kirtar used the device to cast a devastating spell that crystallized much of the fortress, including Captain Piana and Kirtar himself. While Kamal barely escaped the spell with his life, the Mirari fell into the hand of its other pursuers, Ambassador Laquitus, who became equally obsessed with the device, but had to give it up to one of his minions. The Ambassador's minion took the artifact back to the Mare Empire. Uh, Kamal's pursuit, however, ended at the port town of Breaker Bay, the nearest he could get to the Empire. While he was there, he entered the local pits, but was unimpressed by the competition. He did, however, befriend a trio of youths who had been uh, who had been impressed by his fighting skills as he asked to train them. Kamal did so and remained in Breaker Bay until Emperor Abushan used the Mirari to cause a tidal wave that devastated the northern third of Otaria. The Mirari itself was taken back to the Cabal by Braids, who was sorting out artifacts for the Empire. So Kamal returned to Cabal City, 
once again to compete for the orb. While there, he met up with his old friend Chainer, whose skills as a dementia summoner had increased drastically. The two formed a successful partnership that broke the records for the most consecutive wins, but they parted company when the Cabal Patriarch insisted they throw their next match. Kamal refused, as he wanted to win or lose games by his own skill rather than on the whims of match fixers. However, Kamal and Chainer remained friends, and when Chainer asked Kamal to accompany him on his ritual shikar, Kamal agreed without question. Wholesome. Yeah. So they're still good friends. He just, Kamal's an honorable barbarian. Right. Good guy. Mm hmm. Do you want to take this next part here, John? Yeah, sure. All right. So when the ritual began, they tracked and caught a few new creatures for Chainer to summon into battle. However, the pair were ambushed by a druid and several wild animals that were intent on stopping their poaching. Kamal and Chainer won the fight, but afterwards, Kamal felt a great sense of guilt the random slaughter of animals just to feed the pits was exactly what kamal's other friend seton had been trying to stop thankfully chainer felt that the ritual was now complete so kamal was not forced to abandon him in the forest like how that was the other alternative yeah. as right. they returned to the cabal city they found that it was under attack by the order both chainer and kamal entered the battle but kamal was badly injured by an order justicar when Kamal regained his consciousness, he found himself in the Cabal hospital with snake, snake skin grafted over his wounds, skin that Chainer had created for him using the Mirari. Kamal was horrified, as such a procedure went against his barbarian principles. In order to cleanse himself of the additions, Kamal burnt off his skin and left the hospital hol holing up in a cheap hostel to heal naturally. Ultimately, however, Kamal was forced to confront his friend when the curse of the Mirari drove Chainer into madness, causing him to summon a vast horde of dementia horrors. Kamal was unwilling to kill Chainer, however, and instead tried to talk him back at, out of his insanity before it was too late. Tragically, Kamal was unsuccessful as the power of the Mari overcame the Dementia Summoner and warped his body into a hideous mass of dementia beasts. As Chainer died, he gave the Mari to Kamal, who then took the Mari back and attached it to the pommel of his sword with the intention of keeping the dangerous artifact in safe hands. Okay, all right. Well, it's just a good guy. He does seem like a good guy. That's the first possibly good guy we've ever talked about. Right? Andy jinxed it. Good guy, Kamal. Because um, he's about to Kratos. <laughs> uh, Kamal and Mirari. Oh, yeah. If you're not wrong about that, I do remember this. Uh, Kamal and the Mirari. Kamal returned to his old home in the Paradic Mountains, where he was reunited with Jessica and Balthor. Initially, he was content to simply return home, covered in glory, but inevitably the Mirari dominated his mind. He became. The Karn made the Mirari, right? I think I so, yeah. yeah. What a dick. He really. Karn's just a <laughs> real problem in a majority of the story. Well, he was made by Urza, so, like, it's kind of to be expected. Look at my big and dick then... machine. Yeah, he's... <laughs> he's silver. Ugh. Silver and fuck shit up. Yeah. Yeah, let's give him... Let's give him to Teferi. He know what to do. He, oh, uh, oh, no, Teferi. Yeah, no, he, he's a real problem. Um, So, the... I, I lost my, my train there. Um, he became increasingly aggressive and unpredictable, even for a barbarian, and attempted to take control of all the tribes under his dictatorship. Jessica and Balthor tried to reason with Kamal, but were forced to oppose him as the barbarian dived into factions, or divided into factions and ready for war. Kamal's supporters and his opposition met in a dramatic battle, which ended with Kamal viciously impaling Jessica with his Mirari sword, leaving her barely alive, but with an incurable burning chest wound that gradually ate away at her. Shocked into rational thought by this, Kamal recognized the dark influence the Mirari was having on him and resolved to dispose of it for good. Kamal felt a calling from the Crosen Forest and thus decided to travel there and hopefully both heal Jeska and get rid of the Mirari. He was accompanied by a concerned Balthor and also pursued by his old rival, Laquitus. Is is a b incurable burning chest wound that gradually eats away, is that really living? Mm, doesn't seem no. great. No. I don't know how she'd be alive for any amount of time with a incurable burning, burning chest wound. wound. She's a planeswalker. She's <laughs> yoked. Fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, uh, <laughs> When uh, Kamal and Balthor uh, arrived at the edge of the Crosen Forest, they were attacked by Laquatus and a shaky alliance of Kabbalists and Order troops, both of whom who blamed Kamal for the destruction of their bases. As such opposition, Balthor chose to sacrifice himself in order to let Kamal flee with Jessica. Kamal was not left alone, though, as another old friend appeared, the centaur druid Setan, who guided Kamal into the heart of the forest. Kamal left his sister in Seton's care as he journeyed deeper into the forest to purge himself of the Mari's influence. There he met with the ancient Nantuko Thriss, who gave the barbarian an understanding of the druidic way of life, as well as showing him the devastation the Mirari had caused. 
Kamal had uh, spent much time contemplating what he had learned and gradually renounced his own way, his old ways. His meditations were interrupted by Laquatus, who had come to finally claim the Mirari for himself. Their showdown was further complicated by the appear reappearance of Belthor, who had been zombified by Braids and sent to take re revenge upon the merfolk responsible for his death. Unfortunately for Balthor, Laquatus was able to take mental control over him and instead force the undead dwarf to battle his former pupil. Balthor begged Kamal to end his torment, so Kamal was forced to strike down his old mentor. Dang. Not a, not a good way to go. No, but a great card in Magic. Yes, a very <laughs> good card in Magic. Love Mono Black Balthor. I was playing that today. I saw that. Yeah, you said the picture beforehand. Yeah. Um, filled with rage, Ooh. Kamal then turned to Laquatus, a ca uh, the cause of much of the barbarian's misery, and struck the ambassador down with the Mirari sword, leaving the blade embedded in the ground. With the act, Kamal forsook the Mirari in his violent past, becoming devoted to a druidic life in tune with nature. Kamal hoped the Mirari would be out of harm's way in the forest, and that he would be able to use his newfound knowledge to heal his sister and redeem himself. He was very wrong. While he fought <laughs> Laquatus, Jessica was kidnapped by Braids and taken to the Kamal Patriarch, who tried to kill her but instead turned her into phage. When Kamal came to Ephedra to take her back, he discovered to his horror what his sister had become. He agreed to fight her in a pit fight, hoping to find a way to bring her back to normal. But the fight was interrupted by a Chroma who came to avenge Nivea's death. The two siblings joined forces and managed to defeat her. Afterwards, the Cabal and the Croson Forest made an alliance to take on Ixidor, which Kamal led into battle. The symbol of their alliance was the Soul Reaper, an axe made from the Patriarch's old axe and the broken halves of Kamal's Druid Staff. In the battle, he was forced to fight his worst fear, which was his old Mirari possessed persona, which he did manage to defeat. During the fight, innumerable death worms were purged from Phage, returning her to Jeska. Kamal, realizing the death, uh, death worms would consume the world if Jeska did not bring them back into her, was forced to watch his sister become Phage once again. That's pretty sad. Right. Yeah. After, I think Kamal's a good guy. I think he's a good guy who's been put into some bad situations. Yeah. He, he seems like the first good-ish guy, at least. He has a good heart. Right? Got a good heart and some good punch in hands. Yeah. After leaving Jessica, Kamal returned to Krosa and planted himself in a deep meditation near Krosa's center point, declaring that the war was over for him. There he stayed for a year until Stonebrow came to fetch him. At first, Kamal seemed dead, having gone for an entire year without eating or drinking. Stonebrow, in his despair, forced Soul Reaper into Kamal's hands. Green energy flowed from Soul Reaper into Kamal, who revitalized, now mentally prepared for his task. Kamal was finally mentally prepared to kill Phage, and riding upon Stonebrow with a small army of elves, elves, centaurs, and Nantuko, Kamal arrived at Sanctum. Entering the great city, they arrived straight into the center of battle, where Phage and Akromo were engaged into a fight to the death. Kamal approached them and swung the Soul Reaper. The axe claimed Phage and Akroma's lives, as well as an unexpected third life. Good ol' Zagorkas. The three women's souls and bodies flew upwards in a vortex, then combined in an explosion. From the center of that explosion, a radiant being unlike any other was born. Corona, the false god. Flung out of the sanctum and into the desert sands by the explosion that birthed Corona, Kamal regained consciousness. Like most of Otaria, he felt a strong desire to find and grovel before Corona. Before he could chase her, however, Corona came to Kamal. Feeling unworthy, Kamal knelt in worship before Corona, who instead asked him to sit up straight as they found out what the rest of Otaria intended to do. As the horde of Otarians seeking Corona charged closer, Corona flew up and fled. Kamal, like the rest, followed to where she descended. Corona decided to mete out justice, killing a, a couple of nearby people. Oh, jeez. She uh, then ascended and flew away. She just popped down. Killed a couple people and just pop back up. All the uh, all the while, Kamal's perspective solidified from watching Corona kill those creatures. This new resolve allowed Kamal to unite with the reborn Numena and destroy Corona. Hmm. Yeah, after after his death, Kamal lived on as a hero renowned throughout Dominaria, remembered by both the common people and his sister Jessica. The Kamalite druids, including Zid, remained in Krosa as the world's magic and life faltered and they were among those responsible for restoring the world to its former splendor following the resolution of the crisis. At some point in the future, a man named Beru will once again take up Kamal's title as the Fist of Krosa. Much later, Jessica sacrificed herself to close the rift in Otaria's skies, allowing the Great Mending to begin. Immediately after, her dead brother Kamal welcomed her long-separated sister in a white void. While the two, uh, With the two siblings finally reunited, she happily welcomed Oblivion. 
Oh, well, that's that's actually so a happy story. ending finally to one of them. Right? <laughs> we start with that great was... mending, we end with great mending. That was a lot. There, was, there was a lot was in there. Awesome. It was wholesome. There uh, was mending in the multiverse. They mended their relationship. I mean, it was just it's all mending. mending. There is some pretty cool cards of Kamal. I'll let you guys go through them quickly as well. Actually, I've never seen Pit Fighter before. Pit That's... Fighter's a really fun card, yeah. <laughs> That's a really fun, fun card, Dan. It's a six mana six one, and it taps to deal three damage. Yeah, but it's it's fun in a different way. Oh, it's it's fun because it's bad? No, it's not that bad because it is able to ping people. I don't know. And you throw a freed from the reel on that with some infinite mana out there? I mean, he's mono red. Yeah, he, just because he's hey. mono red doesn't mean you have to play him in mono red. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying Kamal Pit Kyle. Fighter is the best commander. Yeah. All right, Dan, I'll put him in Calamax yeah. for the pre-con league. It works. There you go. Mm-hmm. There you go. Um, also, Kamal Fist of Krosa is devastating to anyone who's played against it before. It's really, yes. really fun to wreck people's lands with. It's uh, the four double green human druid for 4-3 that can make target land a 1-1 creature, and then it can give creatures you control 3-3 and gain trample. Love that card. Super strong. And it's designed to make you, like, pump up your own stuff and then give them 3-3 and trample just based on, like, how the card looks. But you can really just pay a green to get someone's... Wreck their lands, yeah. ...and just blow it on up. Well, or somebody goes to board wipe and you dump 10 mana into taking out 10 lands with the board wipe. The amount of time I've been in that situation makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good, it's a fun way to play magic, to be honest. Your friends might yeah. not have fun, but you will. And then obviously from Commander Legends, Kamal Heart of Krosa, which is a phenomenal card. And again, does a similar thing. Beginning of combat on your turn, creatures you control get 3-3 three, three and gain trample. And then you can, until end of turn, target land you control becomes a 1-1 one, one with Vigilance, Indestructible, and Haste, it's still a land. And it does partner, which is such a great mechanic. In, um, in, Ka- the, the, in Kamal's Desire, he straight up looks like Thanos. Looks oh my cool. gosh. That is oh, very yeah. that good. Is Thanos. He's that... even purple. <laughs> yeah, Kamal's in a lot. Kamal's Sledge, Kamal's Druidic Vow, Kamal's Desire, Kamal's Su- oh, or Kamal's Kamal's Summons. Summons. I played that card in the in the bear deck. It's a really cool card in the bear deck. I don't have that one in my bear deck. It's a very good card. I should. I did not bear know it was Kamal uh... in, uh, or Kamal's just quoted on Biorhythm. Is he really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen Life's Purpose, and now it is my very own. I don't understand why Biorhythm's banned. It's eight mana. It's a lot. It, yeah. It's a banning. I mean, EDH. Oh, wait. Where's It's bio? not a lot to get to. Yeah, but you still have the... You, you've got the Biorhythm Druid. I can't remember wait, his name. Wait, that's right. banned? Yep. That is yep. legal in uh, Modern Legacy Vintage and Penny because it is 91 cents. Hmm. That is really disappointing. I would I would like to play with that card now. Right, and a lot of uh, land destruction cards. Looking at it now, I did not know, by the way, that uh, Seedborn Muse had a Kamal quote on it. His voice is the wilderness, savage and pure. Kamal, true really? acolyte. Yeah. Oh, was it the? Oh, it's not even the onslaught one. It's the Commander Legends one, or not Commander? I think twenty nineteen. No, it's just the normal Seedborn. Yeah. Golly, Beru Fist of Krosa is also a card I've never seen before. Beru is very cool. I use Beru to run train on my. It is uh it's a really, really good card with a Shia. Whenever oh my. One one uh he's uh for those of you who don't know, he is a five mana four four legendary creature human druid uh from the time spiral sets, so he has that really funky future sight border. Uh and he says whenever a forest comes into play, green creatures you control get plus one plus one and gain trample until end of turn. He and is- then he has what was that I, I was I was gonna say he's one of the finishers in my primal surge kind of deck. Because you get a Shia out, you get him out, so all your creatures get so much. There's literally no way to live through the through the Primal Surge loop I have. Through the fist. Can't be done. I, if you have an end-the-turn card. No, actually you can't. Once Primal Surge is started, it's it's over. There's nothing that so can be done. Actually, actually, Dan, mm-hmm. I know how to stop it. How? All right, so you need Asceticism. Mm-hmm. You need Platinum Empyrean. Mm-hmm. You need um, Privileged Position. Mm-hmm. And then you need another card that gives all your enchantments hexproof. Oh, um, their privileged position, and there's another one. There's like yeah. a whole little combo you can do with that. So as long as cards. so as long as my life total can't change. Oh, and then you have to have the Ashaya. Sterling yes. Grove. The, that was the other one. Now, let me tell you the fun rules interaction with it. 
with Beru entering and let's say 70 cards from your deck, whatever your commander is, is going to be a 77. Yeah, it was, it was Sterling Grove was the other one I was thinking of. So even though your life change, your life total can't change, you will still take the damage. Ah, but with a Shia or not a Shia, um, the angel, I have hex proof. Yeah, but it, so the way mine comes in, it's Bane of Progress. <laughs> it gets to the whole field. All right. So Avacyn, Angel of Hope. Yep. So it's eight cards to stop your deck now. Eight cards. Well, that's the, I, I don't think there's personally a way to actually, oh, no, sorry. That's the other thing is you get uh, Infect one. Hmm. one. One of the Maybe. Infect creatures too. There's a lot. There, it, it's a really big loop. I'll have to show you the deck. It's very fun. It's really, it's really fun to get through people's uh, Teferi's protections and stuff though. I absolutely love Primal Surge decks too. Because you get, uh, you, you go off, sorry, sorry, I'm ranting here, but uh, you, you go off with Questing Beast, and Questing Beast is so annoying. Combat damage can't be prevented. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Man, I love that game. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Honestly, Karametra Primal Surge is super fun, but you have to be careful about running any of the draw cards because uh, I used to have like Elvish Visionaries and stuff in the deck. Yeah. Let me tell you, that's a problem because you Primal Surge <laughs> your whole deck and have a draw trigger on the stack. And then you die. Yep. I mean, dredge. Well, no, you don't have anything to dredge. Everything's on the field. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, it gets everything. That's a big problem. But yeah, no, like I said, I could I could ramble about Primal Surge decks all day. Um, thank <laughs> you guys so much for listening to it. I'm actually surprised that we got through so much of it today in one go because Kamal is a big story on its own. Um, yeah. Finally, honestly. finally, we have one character in Magic who just doesn't suck outright. Kamal the good guy. Kamal the good guy. He did kind of kill everyone. He did stab his sister, but in comparison to everyone else, it's pretty good. It's an A plus in my book. Of all the evil, so I'm chalking it up as a W. Yeah. Yep. Yes. He's, we'll, he's no Yogmoth and Urza. I'll give you that. You know, Phage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even Phage was worse. Yeah. Right. He was. He was just doing barbarian things. The Mirari just seems like a real problem. Karn just seems kind of like a jerk. Learn kind of like he's dad. the legacy of Urza. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But yeah, no, that's like I said, I just wanted to end there. We'll we'll get back into it. We'll be back with another lore episode again very shortly. Thank you guys so, so much for listening. Um, yes. I will let everyone mm-hmm. know where they can find our stuff. So you can find everything basically on IntoThe99.com. Uh, it really helps to support us if you like and share any of the stuff. Reach out to us and let us know if you like it. We've been getting a lot of messages as well of people who like the lore episodes. Very fun to record them, so thank you guys so much for listening. Um, We do stream. We have multiple uh, other shows. We have Brewing It Live with Lotus. Check that out. We have the actual podcast, Into the 99. Lots of stuff. Everything you can find on IntoThe99.com. That's pretty much it. And, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening in. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Thanks for watching. Toodaloo. I guess listening. <laughs>